Well, it is now time for me to introduce the next speaker. And this next speaker that I am introducing is a prominent leader within the blockchain community. He's a serial visionary who has pioneered several software projects that are considered indispensable and highly forked throughout this space. He's leading the organization behind LibP2P, DRAND, and even to brand new benchmarking environments like TestGround, and of course, the protocols that we know are set to change the way we store and transmit information as we know it. On the behalf of Chainsafe and our viewers, I'm extremely pleased to present the founder and CEO of Protocol Labs, visionary entrepreneur and engineer Juan Benet. Yes. Are you all good? All right, awesome. Hey, thank you so much for that super kind introduction. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, super stoked for the conference. It's been really amazing to hear all of these conversations and um, get to ask questions and and be part of uh, actually bring together the community in this way. Uh, you know, I think 2020 has been super hard for tons of people uh, around the world, and um, and it's just really great to actually get to spend time together and uh, reinvigorate our um, uh, our projects and our on our lives with. Uh, with with the missions that we're we're pursuing together, so thank you so much for bringing us together and for organizing this. I'll chat about the next wave Web three. Uh, the uh, what this talk is um, kind of about is I want to give us the time and space to reconnect with uh, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, so the first part of this talk uh, is gonna uh, go into is gonna remind ourselves what uh, what Web three is about and why it matters. Uh, then I'll give uh, an update about. Filecoin and and what's happening in in uh, with the ecosystem, and then I'll kind of have some parting thoughts for uh, what next year and the upcoming you know, kind of short term future might be um, might look like for for the space. Uh, and yeah, so let's let's go through it. Uh, it's I love starting a lot of these conversations uh, about Web three with um, just reconnecting with why um, why a lot of us are working on what we're doing because um, in our day to day. Uh, when we're working on a project or working on on an application and so on, it's so easy to lose sight of the bigger picture and to just um, get so focused on kind of the day to day on the simple applications that we're working on um, on the current problems of the day that um, we can easily just lose sight of why these individual pieces connect up to a much bigger picture. So um, the claim here and what I think um, you know I think a lot of people in, in Web three will agree is. Uh, you know, the internet is the world's most um, important technology today, and Web3 is bringing a bunch of important principles. Um, and the internet itself is just a part of computing as a bigger um, phase transition for humanity. So in the last um, 80 years, computing has radically transformed uh, who we are and how we operate. Uh, right now, we are able to be together in this virtual room and spending time with each other, um, even though uh, we are. Uh, um, we are all a far apart and so on. We walk around with supercomputers in our pockets. We walk around with um, now screens uh, in our in our uh, laptops and so on and in our phones and soon in our headsets. And uh, more and more computing is uh, turning us into a very different species. And it's happening very quickly. So 80 years is not a long time. Um, if you now think uh, of all of the advances and uh, different pieces of technology that came in to, to facilitate this transition. Um, and you start thinking about sci-fi books and, and uh, even what you know about technology and what's coming in the next few decades, um, you can extrapolate a, a very, very different, very different future outlook. So today we have you know, billions of humans and trillions of computers working together, deeply integrated and so on. And we have this really amazing uh, computing platform where most of our human activity is um, suddenly it, it's more and more mediated by, by this application platform. And what's beautiful about this is this whole setup, it, there's a this massively equalizing um, force that the internet uh, uh, came, to, uh, came to introduce, which is that because it's built on open standards and um, it is not really uh, uh, locked down and it was built by, by a network of hackers who uh, really cared a lot about um, the properties of of these platforms and the properties of uh, being able to upgrade the system and and really letting anybody uh, contribute their their version of the um, uh, of computing and the internet. 
uh, it yielded a system that we can change dramatically. We can grant people whole superpowers uh, by writing an application or writing a new system, a new um, piece of infrastructure, deploying it to the world. And if people use it, then they get that superpower. Uh, it's truly amazing. And we live it day to day. So it's kind of you know commonplace and it's so easy to disregard and so easy to, to uh, take for granted. Uh, but it really is an amazing, completely magical um, environment that we live in where we can grant these amazing upgrading superpowers to other humans uh, by just getting together and writing software. And very fundamental changes are coming ahead. So there's many different kinds of interfaces that are um, that we're playing around with and, and uh, improving things like AR and VR, brain machine interfaces and whatnot. Uh, and then there are, of course, a whole slew of changes coming with all of the AI advances from you know, very specialized AIs to potentially AGI and robotics in the in the future. So when you kind of sit in you know 2020 and you look back and you think, well, computing has dramatically changed us in the in the last 80 years, and we're a very different uh, group of humans today than than uh, than we were in 80 years ago, and you kind of start thinking about what's going to happen in the next 80 years and uh, you know the remainder of the century, uh, very big changes are coming. Uh, it's not clear exactly what's going to happen and what the sequence might be or when things might happen happen and and so on, uh, but it is pretty clear that in a short time span, we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll undergo a, again, another dramatic transformation, um, and likely much more, uh, much more impactful than, than the last 80 years. So I think that if the last 80 years are uh, template to go by, uh, I think the transformation will be much deeper uh, in, in the next 80. So where does that put us? Um, well, today, we, most of the uh, computing infrastructure that we have is, um, Though it's very open and malleable, and you can uh, deploy and improve a bunch of systems, uh, it doesn't have a, a set of critical properties that allow you to trust the infrastructure. So, um, the internet, which was first the wires and the connectivity framework, uh, gave rise to the web, which became the static distribution medium for a lot of information and, and applications, and that led to kind of this read-write interactive uh, web 2.0. And web 2.0 has a, a pretty significant flaw, which is because the advertising model is a big part of the picture, uh, it created an environment where this amazing superpower, uh, super sets of superpowers and supercomputers connected everywhere with you know, hardware and cameras and microphones everywhere, um, contributed to building the you know, most crazily effective um, surveillance, surveillance system and, and tracking system ever devised, right? And, and uh, given computing and given how it works and so on, it's it's uh, very straightforward that you would land at something like this. Um, but now the question is, how do we how do we upgrade our systems to in introduce the properties that we need to make sure that we end up with with safe environments? So the really important thing to do here is make sure that the we we have this phase transition in in the web where we go from. Uh, this web 2.0 world that is read write interactive and, and you know, very powerful and we introduce a set of very important properties to establish uh rights and to establish um trustability uh it's not trust in the system through verifiability so that's the big thing that web3 is doing uh all all of the different kinds of primitives and systems that that we are coming up with are all in one way or another uh always coming back to trust adding um Compute, uh, through very different kinds of cryptographic primitives or game theory or you know, incentive structures and so on, we're bringing verifiability to our systems and our networks and getting rid of intermediaries, um, making things uh, more long-term, long -term, um, safer and so on. Now, of course, each new wave of computing brings a lot of uh, chaotic environments and all kinds of new potential problems and so on. So I strongly encourage you to think through what you're building as well and, and make sure that what you're making isn't necessarily uh, uh, you know, accidentally introducing other kinds of uh, other kinds of problems, and uh, problems will come, and we'll have to solve them. So, some of the the values that you can uh, think about when when you're building web three oriented uh, things are, you know, this is kind of my my stab at it. Uh, I think it would be a really good idea to kind of collect together uh, the web three values and put them in some some website somewhere, and and uh, of course our communities will uh, disagree. There'll be you know some uh, a lot of contention with some of these, even um, you know, even with a list this small, we you can probably find uh, many Web3 people that kind of 
disagree on some of these. Uh, but I think it's very useful to at least have a, a shape of the problem here. Um, we we kind of operate today in a world that has um, a lot of de facto freedom of speech and freedom of assembly through uh, the digital medium, but that may not last. That may change. Uh, many different kinds of um, power structures will benefit from um, from an internet that is much more uh, controlled and much more uh, where, where borders spring up and where people can't actually communicate freely. So in our time, we will have to fight a number of fights to preserve this this freedom and to hopefully lock it in into the into the infrastructures that we use. Now beyond that, there's uh, all kinds of things that we don't fully have yet. So freedom of transaction, uh, that's something relatively new. We're we're getting there, but it's not quite uh, not pervasive yet. Most of the people connected to the internet don't yet have this uh, this set of properties. And there's you know things beyond that from you know being able to have uh, sovereign storage in a sense where you can uh, fully own and control the data that you produce and share and so on, and you don't have to um, uh, be have it be subservient to some other uh, kind of massive data monopoly or something like that. Uh, and to then being able to write these amazing application superpower things with verifiability embedded in them so that when you go and grant that superpower to other parties, they don't have to trust you and you don't accidentally end up in a position where you could actually subvert the entire system by um, by abusing that that um, that privilege, or uh, somebody using your your uh, systems, right? So the the um, very simple example is all of the um, manipulation that's going on in the world through the social networks right now is a, is a perfect example of what happens when you build a super powerful system and then uh, attackers start using it, right? So um, Cambridge Analytica using Facebook kind of thing is the Classic example, but there's so many, so many more things that could happen. So, I hope that you know the big takeaway here is you, these um, really important values are um, what uh, we're at the core of so many of our applications and our systems. So, really encourage you to uh, to think through them and think through which ones you really care about and you and your your groups want to make sure uh, exist in the world. Uh, so, Web three, if you're um, not, I think for now most people will be pretty familiar with the with the term, terminology and so on. Uh, I, I tend to think that this is a combination of these three broader groups of um, broader efforts: the decentralized web, blockchains, and linked data. And uh, I, I spoken before about uh, this. I kind of think think of this as a talk that continues these other uh, other talks I've given in the last last few years. Um, so um, yeah, you can. Uh, I, I won't speak uh, uh, as deeply into some areas as as I did then. Uh, so now I want to maybe describe how we think about these values and we think about um, the projects that we're making. So you know we are working on a number of things that um, and Proclabs working on a number of things that uh, um, contribute some some uh, are, are trying to affect some of the changes that, that I'm talking about here. And in reality, we contribute to a lot of projects. So we we probably uh, help out on a number of the things here on the screen. And this is, again, a snapshot that I took many years ago. There's a ton of other projects here that, that aren't well represented. Um, but we started, we, we were lucky enough to have started a few. And I kind of want to describe sort of why, how they connect, right? So, um, and so over time, we'll have more projects and, and whatnot. But uh, uh, these connect into what we sort of describe a, a, as a stack that um, helps bring uh, helps upgrade the web and the the application platform to have a number of those properties the the reason we ended up separating them into different projects and we ended up with kind of like a word soup of of um uh, of acronyms and so on is that each one of these pieces uh introduces a um a different set of properties into the network and it is best to kind of create these things in a in a modular way in a reusable way where many other people can use the the, the tech and you don't have to kind of build these uh, monolith, monolithic uh, systems and applications that, that over time will kind of just give way, right? So a good example of this is if you look back to the peer-to-peer -peer wave of the early 2000s, so many important things got built there. Think of BitTorrent and Skype and so on, but they were monolithic uh, applications. And so it, were, it was very difficult to reuse those systems for, for, other, um, for other things. And so, uh, kind of one of the goals that we've had along the way is to do the extra work to go and modularize and, and break up pieces so that other people can use them. Now, um, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, look-at-peer is 
so that we can have a, a kind of interoperable peer-to-peer uh, -peer stack. Um, there's all kinds of problems that, that I'm describing that come from not having a, a, a really good um, a peer networking layer. And so that's kind of the, what um, Lipid is hopes to, hopes to solve. And this is, Lipid is broadly adopted in the Web3 space and it enables a kind of interoperability across systems um, that's super flexible and super, super nice um, that people have not really pushed on them that much, right? So now in the last year and a half, we've now finally gotten like, these ma major blockchains to, to move over to using Lipid2P. And now that we have this common stack and common framework of, of all these pieces, now is when we're gonna start to see um, people writing tools and applications and so on um, that help bridge this world. And so we hope that it'll contribute to um, interoperability and convergence of, of the stack. Uh, we're building IPFS because we think, you know, the web itself uh, should work peer to peer. You should uh, be able to move around the content. You should be able to address it wherever you, you want. You shouldn't rely on one central party defining what the content is. Uh, the content should be defined by um, by a scriptographic hash and and so on, and uh, you know the, this in that simple kind of statement of, of saying, hey, it would be great to have content on the network be addressed by cryptographic hash to get that integrity and and verifiability that comes from that um, is kind of wh where the whole IPFS project uh, comes from, and you know, it's a larger uh, effort with uh, a lot of different uh, folks in a, a pretty large community. Um, and many other systems that, that use it, right? So the entire, you know, you can think of embedding the entire Falcon ecosystem within the IPFS ecosystem um, and so on and many, many other many other groups. Um, the big thing is to is to upgrade the application platform, specifically browsers and mobile and so on, and the connectivity layers between whenever we're exchanging static information to make sure to address it in a content address way. Uh, and to move it around with a with a protocol that that facilitates peer to peer distribution as opposed to uh, kind of going through the rails of of a few centralized parties, and you know really uh, this is uh, definitely watch um, uh, the IPFS talk from uh, earlier in the week. Uh, but you know we've made a lot of progress over the years in in getting um, a lot of traffic coming going through IPFS and uh, also browser adoption. There's a, a really cool uh, in, important upgrade to this where I think Brave will now pass Opera. Uh, uh, fairly soon because now they're they're uh, they're embedding uh, IPFS itself in um, in the browser, right? So the, a whole full node will will come into Brave, and so expect this to 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 totally change. Uh, um, this slide is also pretty old, uh, and uh, Brave is now kind of overtaking Opera here. And you know we're we're building Filecoin to uh, create an environment where we can back up and uh, serve. All of this data in a crypto native way where you can have um, anybody providing services to the network and be paid in cryptocurrency for it um, and you can build applications that you can deploy into the network and sort of walk away from uh, so Falcon is a, it's a very large system uh, it's a um, like IPFS and like Lib2P yeah, it expanded to to a, a broader um, set of goals and and so on I won't explain the whole thing here, but I'll give you kind of a glimpse into into the picture. You can think of many different layers to uh, to Falcon and different uh, components of the of the system. And um, you know the mission is to create a decentralized and efficient uh, and robust foundation for humanities information, which is you know, a really the hope for a long term um, application foundational layer that that isn't really controlled by anybody. That is sort of like the internet. That is sort of like um, the web itself, where you can just rely on the system working and you can kind of address all your data with IPFS and back up your content with Popcoin and then bet on it being there for, for the long term. Now, some of the problems that Popcoin addresses, uh, things like making sure the, the cloud can be decentralized, uh, try to optimize the system by introducing uh, markets, uh, deal with kind of uh, the problems of uh, Monopoly, data monopolies, uh, and so on, destroying applications or changing them too much when um, when you don't want them to change, and so on. Uh, you can think of uh, now a, a more permanent layer for for data being being available. Uh, and yeah, one of the key things that key features that Falcon brings to the table that no other cloud does is it gives you cryptographic proofs uh, that verify that the storage is there um, over time. And so that's a really key property that. Uh, nobody really does yet, and and that's a a, uh, a really useful uh, primitive for the future. 
Uh, the broader picture, as you can imagine, kind of the world right now, most of the information that we consume and most of the um, information that we store and so on is, is uh, grouped into a few uh, large scale data centers. And it would be really great to transition into something like this where um, storage providers can add uh, for, for many different organizations come together and form a market that can back up our uh, our data. And so really it's kind of turning a, a market that sort of like looks like this, where, well, the scale here is, is off, really the top three are, you know, uh, the vast majority of the of the, uh, of the the traffic and, and, and the storage and so on. Um, and really combine it with, with a model kind of like Airbnb's where uh, really you enable the smaller players to compete with the large ones, right? So uh, if, in the Airbnb world, you were trying to rent out your room and um, compete with uh, with a hotel chain. That was uh, pretty difficult. But once you created a market, uh, that became easy. And so, that in a similar way, imagine being kind of one, some of the smaller storage providers that today have to compete with each other and the big players, and really thinking of the rest as a as a market that can come together and and uh, be much more efficient and 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 robust. So a uh, Another word, I'm coming close on time here. I'm gonna kind of like blaze through a little bit of this. I've recorded this in, in other um, uh, in other settings. And so I'll uh, drop a link later to, to a talk where um, I go through a, through a lot of this in, in great detail. And, and also Colin uh, in our team uh, gave a, a, an even more fleshed out version of, uh, of this update that is really amazing. Uh, really encourage you to, to check it out. Uh, the biggest news is that Falcon is live. The network is uh, alive and kicking. Um, there's, you know, we have a blockchain. We uh, are moving around a ton of data, and you know, past um, one extra byte, which is a huge amount of storage. Um, we are booting up this storage economy with uh, miners and clients and developers and so on, and and getting the entire economic flows of of producing this cloud storage and using it uh, to work with a crypto native um, uh, system and, and an asset and so on. And the facility, you know, there's a whole pretty significant scale of facilities coming together. Um, a lot of different companies around the world. Uh, uh, amazing uptake in in in, uh, in Asia and China specifically. Uh, it's been amazing to see the the adoption there just uh, uh, blow up tremendously. It's been uh, uh, really great. And the road ahead for for the future is expanding that out to uh, to other uh, other areas of the world. Uh, the network size is yeah, it's, it's pretty big. Like the uh, there's really kind of like two need to update this chart, but it but it's in in about three months we got to 1.2 exabytes, which is a massive amount of storage, and so this really starts hitting uh, cloud scale, and so now we can actually think about uh, competing with those environments. Now, of course, it'll take a quite a long time to deal with all of the feature sets that that um, industry really needs. So so this will be a, a pretty long slog, similar to cloud taking um, many years to to go from. Um, kind of being available, AWS being available, or something like that, to actually consuming most of the um, most of the the market usage and so on. So, so this is it's a long term long term thing for sure. But it's really amazing that in a very short time we actually now have um, the scale to be able to do that. So the you know ecosystem is growing. Um, one go, uh, you, you should uh, watch the talks that I mentioned. They go into detail into a lot of the activity that's going on. You know, various different really cool applications, um, all kinds of stuff that I, that I want to get a chance to talk to you about now. Uh, I did want to give a massive shout out to the whole ChainSafe team for uh, being phenomenal uh, partners in building out this network. So, um, you know, probably about a year or so ago, I don't remember, maybe longer, probably it's been uh, kind of a blur. Uh, we got to chatting about um, about the possibilities of working together on uh, on Falcon and and change of building a an implementation of the protocol and a bunch of other things and you know they took a, a a huge bet on on the ecosystem and they've been really phenomenal to work with in in so many ways uh, so really thank you folks for for being a uh, great you know sharing and building this amazing new resource and network with us uh, it's been fantastic to work together uh, and uh, really all of us from uh, PL and from many other organizations in in the Falcon ecosystem. Uh, just really love working with you and, and think it's a um, look ahead for, for a really bright future together. So thank you so much for, for uh, taking the plunge. And, you know, here's to many more more years ahead. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, move out of this uh, because I think we're uh, at, at the time. Uh, the kind of like remaining 
thing I wanted to to sort of leave you with is uh, that there's a, a pretty big wave of Web3 applications that's going to um, going to appear uh, because we're seeing the the emergence of a bunch of different uh, next generation blockchains that are kind of testing te testing the waters. Uh, Filecoin is coming to the picture with a vast amount of storage. Uh, there's interoperability that's going to come together, and so the applications that are going to get built in between now and say middle of next year are going to be this super massive wave in in um, in, in Web three, right? So uh, if we think of think of it kind of like when Ethereum first started, uh, that it took about you know kind of six to twelve months, six to eighteen months or so for the first generation of applications to to really come into the scene and really hit in a in a really big way and kind of have the first big waves of the Ethereum applications. That's sort of happening now. Um, people are are currently building the next generation applications on top of these next generation systems that just deployed. So it's it's a super exciting time. So if you're not in in a uh, deep into the weeds of a lot of these systems and projects, uh, now's a now's a an amazing time to get involved. Um, and there's all kinds of things going on from uh, hackathons to accelerators to um, uh, lots of funding in the space to to help um, build projects, uh, both in terms of grants and in terms of um, uh, uh, investment into companies and whatnot. So uh, really an amazing time to, to get involved. Uh, great, I'll pause here. Uh, if there's time for questions, happy to take them, but I also don't wanna uh, take the next speaker's time. Thank you. Thanks, Juan, that was amazing. It's fascinating to um, get general talks as Web3 is changing the paradigm of the internet. It's great to like have an overview for people and also how these things like modularity are going to change the game. So let's just relax and answer all these questions because they're all great questions. So I'm gonna start with the ones with the most votes. When originally building IPFS, how many of the tools that ended up being built were evident as necessary at the time? And how many got organically added to the stack of tools as the project grew? Uh, great question, so I think, um... Probably now, I would say the majority of the tooling around IPFS uh, is organically developed. Um, that said, from the beginning, maybe, I, maybe I'll mention a few core things. So um, the networking layer being a really big deal, um, which now eventually turned into the core of Lip2P, uh, that was kind of clear from the get-go. The fact that we would need something um, to do content routing in a scalable way um, was very clear from the beginning. Uh, it was clear that a DHT would sort of get us part of the way there and maybe work for a few years, but then break. Um, and this is kind of where we are, where um, the DHT has served us pretty well for for a number of years. But now we're we actually hit the scale where um, that's just not the right solution in the in the long term. Or, or we, we might make a, a a new kind of DHT that that might do it, um, but we might also explore other kinds of routing systems. Um, things like the gateway were always. Uh, you know, from the beginning, um, part of the plan, and and they've been they stuck around and become very successful. Um, I sort of expected that the browser integrations would have picked up more by now. Um, or sorry, not the browser integrations, the tooling with JavaScript to make it a um, an easy to deploy uh, uh, environment. It, it's pretty good, but it's but I think um, more people are relying on the gateway than I think it should be relying on JavaScript directly. Um, and the browser integration is something that surprised me as to how fast they went. So I was expecting not really being considered by major browsers for you know ten years, um, and it's really yeah. sort of been like five. So so that's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. So is there anything that was totally unexpected that you needed to build straight away? Um, I think probably the a big oversight in the initial design was. Um, we should have made PubSub a much bigger part of the picture from the get-go, so that's one piece. Oh, and then IPLD. So the entire IPLD layer came too late. So that, um, if I were to go back and kind of introduce a set of ideas uh, into the beginning would be all the IPLD layer of things, how to model the content, how to represent data structures, uh, make it a really flexible layer and so on. Um, the first design of IPFS was very rigid in, into just how to Unix-based file system. And that ended up just creating a lot of layers of complexity that were probably unnecessary. Um, That's cool. That's great. So here's the next question. Um, you have described DRAND as a fundamental building block of the internet, comparing it to NTP. 
what are the most exciting things you want to see DRAND used for outside of blockchain and leader re-election? Um, great question. So I think I think a random is become is one of these primitives that um, so many applications need, and they sort of solve in a, in their own kind of haphazard way, and it's a really pain painful uh, thing to do. And if we manage to build this layer that everybody can trust will just be there, uh, that'll start seeping into into a ton more applications. Uh, I mean, the use of randomness is, is uh, ever present and most of sources of randomness are not very good. Uh, and people make mistakes about this uh, all the time. So I think um, maybe to, to part of the question's point, like what is sort of in the near term? I think blockchains will be probably the biggest adopters because the need for good randomness is so high um, and they're willing to to uh, trust uh, a, a new systems and so on more, uh, where say larger scale industries may not. Um, that said, I think uh, yeah, I, th I think we'll we'll see what happens over the next uh, year or two as as the you know proof of stake blockchains arrive as as Falcon relies on DRAND. Um, it'd be amazing to see another blockchain start using it for consensus um, or lotteries. So I think uh, now lotteries with with you know, fair and unbiasable randomness would be would be great. Yeah, that's cool. I actually can't think of something outside of blockchain that needs randomness as badly as we yes. need. So, <laughs> all right. So there's two questions that are quite similar. I think I'll try to collapse them, but um, maybe I'll ask the first question. If the whole world started using Filecoin tomorrow, would there be any blockers for that amount of data needed to be stored? Yeah, so I think the biggest blockers are just interface tooling and getting the flows from clients to miners working super well. So um, the network is evolving in, in the following stages. We you know, first building the protocol, then um, getting miners used to the protocol and, 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 and so on, then actually launching the network and building a bunch of capacity. That's sort of the stage we're in now. And we're starting the, the next stage, which is um, getting clients onboarded uh, starting to use a lot of the flows, um, getting a, lot, a bunch of utility out of the network, uh, and then then scaling clients. So think of now as kind of the, the pioneering moment where a lot of new applications and new new users are, are starting to build their applications on top of Filecoin, um, and it'll take a while to flesh out all the all the UX uh, and dev tooling um, that that should really be there, and especially retrieval. So I think um, uh, it's really awesome to work together on the retrieval market. Uh, that's one area that I think will be super, super valuable for uh, for really enabling everybody to sort to use Falcon. Meaning, um, if everybody stored their data on Falcon right now, um, uh, we would start congesting the traffic uh, to the miners very quickly. So the miners right now can serve it to everybody because the traffic on retrieval is not that high. As soon as that scales up, uh, that will need a much more CDN style uh, style system, which uh, you know we can build over the next year, and that that should the timing on that should be should be fine. Yeah, that's a great and also predictable answer. But also, I was personally, for me, I think one thing that gets me super excited about the Filecoin ecosystem is the verified data and people who verify the data. So it'd be interesting if we all woke up tomorrow and everything was stored on Filecoin. And yeah, where be, do we start verifying? Yeah, be, so by the way, congratulations on on the awesome launch. Uh, uh, super stoked about about the product um, and really look forward to using it. Uh, and you know it'd be amazing to see uh, the files product have that verifiability be clear to the user, right? So this is not something that most users care about yet or don't think about. But it would be cool cool to see maybe the the history of a file and like you have the verifiability over time, right? So I don't know if any user would actually want this feature today. So you know uh, maybe not need to build it if, if nobody cares about it. But but um you know on a personal use basis, it would be really nice to see kind of verifiably when a file got introduced or published uh, or uh, um, yeah. Reshared and so on. Uh, this might be more valuable to communities. So, so communities. That's when that's when that kind of verifiability becomes super important. Knowing when a data, data set entered the picture, when a specific piece of data came came online, and knowing that that data is is being kept around. That verifiability for communities really, really, really matters. So, think of um, also being able to see the mutating history of a of important data. So, if you see a newspaper article change over time, making that verifiable and you know exactly when that happened uh, and knowing that you know what information was there and what what are they citing and referencing and what is the mutability on those things. Like 
that entire you know the web of media and its change and making that um, permanent, easily accessible, and verifiable. Like that, that I think is going to be a, a really valuable um, use of verifiability. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I feel like it links into data economies, like to import a little bit of Glenn Wiles' work into here. I think that verifiability would be really matter over there. Yeah. So thank you so much, Juan. This was an amazing presentation. Thank you and so on much. On behalf of Chainsafe and our viewers, this was great. Uh, thank you so much. Great to hang out. Uh, thanks for having me and, and see you around. Yeah, see you around.